Fellowship of Grace Presbyterian Church on this final Sunday in August. I'm out watching the bees gather the pollen, I guess to make that last bit of honey before winter comes. And I know I pulled out a, um, a long sleeve shirt this morning because it was just cool enough to do that. And yet we're, we're sitting in the midst of a uh, news cycle and a political election cycle that's really heating up. So it's good to be aware of all of the things in our outside world. And yet this hour is a time for us to gather together as God's people to recreate, to be replenished and be refilled and to be God's people with one another. And so I hope that you receive some, some blessing and grace today in this time. So there's, a, there's just really only a few things going on in the life of the church. Uh, Paul continues to do his daily Zoom uh, devotions, and that's wonderful fellowship. Also today we'll be taking up a food offering for Mary's Pantry. So please remember the hungry in our midst. So today we're gonna to open our worship with a, with a psalm. I think it's familiar to many of us. It's from Psalm 46. Hear the word of the Lord. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with this tumult. Please pray with me. Lord, who made all this beauty, who made us, and who have placed us all here in this time and place, help us to cling to the truth that you are a very present help. You are present with us and you long to be be with us and to help us and so we offer ourselves to you this morning as your people bless us and be present with us and we pray it in the name of Jesus amen
just sang really does say it all. That though trial should come, though Satan's attack should come, that we can enjoy the bliss of this glorious thought that our sin is nailed to the cross so that we don't have to bear it anymore. And all we have to do to get that sin nailed to the cross is to confess it to God. And it's very important for us to do that both individually and as God's people. The Old Testament considers God's people to be all of Israel. And so we're going to use a confession from the Old Testament and um, know that we are Israel in God's eyes. And so let's confess together. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. So the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against you. Let's confess silently now. We can say, it is well with my soul, because our sin is nailed to the cross and we bear it no more. Hear the good news. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. And now as God's people, as Israel, we turn to offer to God our tithes and gifts and offerings because it is well with our soul. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall that's planted by the water. We shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted
together we shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the Gracious, giving God, God who has given us all things, including a savior, including a beautiful world, including life and breath. We return to you now what we can and ask for you to bless these tithes and gifts and offerings and bless us so that it all can be a blessing to your world. And we pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. I will be reading from Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 34 in your Bible. Simon, Simon, listen. Satan has received permission to test you all, to separate the good from the bad, as a farmer separates the wheat from the chaff. But I have prayed for you, Simon that your faith will not fail. And when you turn back to me, you must strengthen your brothers. Peter answered, Lord, I am ready to go to prison with you and to die with you. I tell you, Peter, Jesus said, the rooster will not crow tonight unless or until you have said three times that you do not know me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus basically is telling Peter that Satan is out to get you. Not only Peter, but all the other disciples. Now, this is a very serious warning that Jesus is giving, not only to Peter and the disciples, but to all of us. Now, why is this? Why do we have to worry about Satan attacking us? Jesus is saying, in a literal sense here, that Satan has been given leave. He's been given permission to sift us like wheat. As to tell about what really is the, uh, the good grain and what is the, the weed or the chaff. And this is the purpose of why this is taking place. We are dependent upon the Lord for our salvation, for our new life in Christ, for forgiveness of sins. But what the Lord really wants more than this is to transform us, to make us into the image of Jesus Christ. And just as Jesus had to be 
tempted by Satan, in a way attacked by him, really, verbally. So we have to be prepared to be attacked or to be confronted by Satan as well. Because God's intention is to transform us into the image of his son. A question that gets debated for years is where did evil come from? Why is there evil in the world? If God created the world good, why is there Satan? Why is the serpent in the Garden of Eden? Why is there evil at all? And uh, we don't have a complete answer to that question. What we do know is that God created a world that is different from him, a world in which there is freedom. Freedom involves choice. And when choices are good, that reconfirms God's good intention in creation. However, when choices are wrong, such as Adam and Eve disobeying God and all the events of human history ever afterward, we see the reality of evil. And that evil enables Satan to get deeper and deeper into our lives and into our world. So creation, we read in the letter of Romans chapter 8, is in bondage to these forces of decay, to these realities of evil, but always with the assurance that Jesus Christ will overcome them all, that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. It's important to note that there is a difference between evil and sin. They're related, but they're not the same. And it's important to keep that in mind. For example, uh, we can say that uh, all evil is sinful, certainly. All evil is a form of sin. But not all sin is evil. Because the way evil is described in Scripture, it is the activity of Satan. And here's the sad truth. We don't need Satan to entice us to disobey God. Our own pride, our own desires, our own conceit, our lying, our stealing, our coveting, desiring things that don't belong to us, all come from within the human heart, as Jesus says. We don't need Satan to teach us how to do those things. We do them by ourselves. Now, this is important because it is significant to see how Jesus relates to sin and relates to evil. If we mistake these two, we're not going to pass the test that's being put upon us of being sifted like wheat, as Jesus says here. When Jesus is dealing with sinners, he welcomes them. He eats with them. He befriends them, really, in a lot of ways. However, in the confrontation with evil, with demonic spirits, Jesus doesn't welcome them. Jesus doesn't socialize with them, would not eat with them. Jesus confronts them and orders them out of whoever they're attacking. So there's a very big difference there. Jesus reaches out to the sinner, but he rejects the evil, the demonic, and that demonic can operate through human sources. And so when Jesus, for example, is talking about the corruption, the satanic influence among even the religious leaders, he is not offering friendship to them or welcoming them or wanting to be uh, socialized with them. He is confronting them with the negative aspects of what they have done, how they've corrupted the law, how they've corrupted the worship of Israel. So it's important to see that there's this distinction, that yes, we reach out to the sinner, we recognize sin in ourselves, we confess sin, but we need to recognize evil where it occurs and know how to, to resist it. How do we determine what is evil as opposed to what is just sinful? Well, when we look at the nature of evil, the nature of Satan, Satan deals with hatred. All those groups, that includes even religious leaders, who demonstrate utter intolerance or hatred are acting out the agenda of Satan. That is what Satan desires to do, to cause uh, disruption, cause pain and suffering through hatred. Not all sin is an expression of hatred. Sin can be an expression simply of uh, 
wrongful desires, uh, desires of the flesh. But evil involves hatred. This is the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Britain, not only one of the most important battles in World War II, but really in all of human history. And uh, it's been the subject of a number one best-selling book, uh, The Splendid and the Vile by Eric Lawson, number one bestseller. And there are a lot of lessons to learn uh, in that book and in that conflict between the Battle of Britain and how we apply this to our own lives. Here's the distinction. Other people in Europe and even in England try to negotiate to some sense with Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. They saw them as sinners, but they saw them as people that they could reach out to, that they could dialogue with, uh, that they could form some kind of mediation. Winston Churchill, to his great credit, saw them only as evil that there was no basis for mediation, no basis for dialogue and discussion. And some people thought he was an extremist, but events bore out what he had in mind. When the Nazis launched their offensive against all of Europe in September 1st, 1939, uh, they had developed uh, military resources that were beyond anything else that anybody in the rest of Europe or indeed the world had. They conquered the whole nation of Poland in the space of one month. They did away with the city of Rotterdam in Holland in the space of two hours. They conquered France in a matter of weeks. In the First World War, there had been a, a standoff between Germany's allies and France and Britain, and Germany never got to Paris. In World War II, uh, they got to Paris in less than a month. So there was this devastating impact uh, of what was called the Blitzkrieg, the Lightning War. So Winston Churchill was made prime minister when uh, France had fallen and uh, England's army had been evacuated desperately at, at the city, at the port of Dunkirk and managed to maintain their soldiers, but lost all their equipment and all their arms. And... Hitler's design then was, having conquered all of Western Europe, the only thing that remained in his path was England. And his goal was to form a United States of Europe with himself, not as president, not even as dictator, but as Fuhrer, as supreme commander. Now, Winston Churchill, in preparing his nation for the onslaught of what would be, was expected to be an invasion of, of Germany against England, held out three basic points, all of which relate to our dealing with the reality of Satan. Because Winston Churchill saw this battle not simply as a political one, as a military one, but as Britain as a holdout of Christian civilization and Nazism as barbarism and even Satanism. We know that Hitler and some of his top uh, lieutenants were influenced by the occult, one of the key hymns that keeps coming up in those histories of World War II is Onward Christian Soldiers. This was a theme that uh, the Allies embraced. They saw themselves literally in a Christian crusade. Churchill understood three basic things in the conflict with uh, the evil of the Nazis. The first one is to know England's vulnerability. Uh, he realized that if England got into a land war, if the Germans once uh, got into the mainland of England, if they crossed over the channel and crossed the beaches, that England would be in a very, very serious situation because they simply did not have uh, the military might, the ground forces, the tanks, and so forth that the, that the Germans did, the Nazis did. So Churchill knew that they had to come up with something that offset that vulnerability, that it could never be the case that foreign troops could land on English soil. We need to know our own vulnerability when we think about Satan sifting us like wheat. What are the areas of our weaknesses? What are the areas of our temptations? What are the areas where we are uncertain about our faith, where we are questioning things? We have to know all that 
and be prepared for them. Churchill placed all of his hope for England to avoid an invasion on the Royal Air Force, specifically on the planes that, airplanes that were called Spitfires. Basically, the Spitfire airplane was a, a plane with a motorcycle engine, very fast and very, very flexible. On top of that, England had developed radar, which enabled them to see when uh, enemy planes were coming over. Uh, the German plan for invasion was to do away with the Royal Air Force, cripple them, uh, and then be able to sail across the 21-mile channel between France and England and invade England and uh, march on to London and conquer England just as they had conquered every other country in Western Europe. The problem with this plan, uh, with the idea of bombers coming in over, over, over England, is that they were no match for the British Spitfires, which kept coming up again and again and again. And even when the Nazis turned to night raids, which made the RAF, uh, uh, created difficulties for the RAF because of not being able to see, even with the radar, uh, those Spitfires and uh, comparable planes, hurricanes, continued to, to fight and then began to bomb Germany itself. And the, the, the Nazi leadership had told the German people that bombs would never fall on Germany or on Berlin. Well, now the RAF was dropping them. And despite all the onslaught of uh, bombing of London and other cities, uh, there was this idea that, uh, that England simply could not surrender. That was the second point, that they could not make common cause. There's no point in signing a peace agreements with Hitler because they were useless. Uh, we can't make common cause with evil. Uh, you can only reject it, identify it, and reject it. And then there was this, the ultimate sense that evil simply could not win. Evil simply could not win. Uh, Churchill, in a famous speech, said, uh, nothing is more true, more certain, than all of what Hitler has done, all of the devastation and destruction he has called, will one day be blasted from the face of the earth and removed forever. And another famous line about the pilots of the RAF is a familiar statement, never in the course of human history has so much been owed by so many to so few. What comes out of this lesson of the Battle of Britain is the saving feature that Churchill had to rally his troops was the idea that they were not simply fighting an enemy. This was not a conflict with sin. It was a conflict with evil. And in a conflict with evil, there can be no mediation. There had been treaties even the British had signed a year earlier, a non-aggression pacts, all of this kind of thing, absolutely useless because Hitler had no intention of keeping them. This was the reality of evil. And the mark of that evil was hatred. Hatred. And that hatred was lived out in the horrors of the Holocaust. Six million Jews killed and millions of others also exterminated in concentration camps and all of that. But for a whole year, England held on. And they actually, they won the Battle of Britain. Because by the time that that battle was over, the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, had been crippled. They had spent so much. Hitler gave up on England and turned toward Russia and violated one of his most uh, significant claims, which was you should never get into a two-front war. And uh, as Hitler invaded uh, Russia, the British bombers kept coming in after, uh, after Germany itself. And the, the beginning of the end was was in place. America comes into the war after Pearl Harbor and all of that. But what is striking when you look at this book that was just published, uh, it is this idea that there can be no common cause with evil. There can be no reproachment. There can be no sense that evil gets one measure of something and we can hold on to some other measure. <clears throat> evil has to be recognized and rejected in its totality. And the thing that is the hallmark of evil is more than just violating God's law, which is sin. But the hallmark of evil 
is the idea of hatred, of despising other people, absolute and total intolerance. And the one thing that we cannot tolerate is evil itself. Uh, this is not a question of sitting down to eat with the enemy, not this enemy. This enemy has to be rejected in every sense of the word. <clears throat> this is Satan. So what we have here then is uh, an important blueprint in our own lives because we have to acknowledge that evil exists in our world, but we can make no common cause with it. This is not a question of there are fine people on both sides. Groups like the Ku Klux Klan or neo-Nazis <clears throat> or other groups that specialize in hatred are evil and have to be defeated. Now, the defeat does not come really ultimately through physical force, but it comes through spiritual power. And we must recognize that the reality of evil, whether it's burning <coughs> cars in streets in American cities or whatever, whenever evil comes out, <coughs> whether it's coming from one perspective <coughs> or another perspective, doesn't change the fact that uh, it is marked by hatred and destruction. And we need to stand against that. We need to call this out and talk about how wrong this is, that <coughs> evil is not going to just go away by itself. The great truth of this is that evil has no ultimate power. It has been vindicated, uh, it's been destroyed and vindicated in Jesus' death on the cross where he's overcome the power of evil. But evil still exists today. And to be faithful Christians, we have to be clear in our opposition to evil wherever it occurs. And to acknowledge the fact that when we see hatred, when we see intolerance, when we see violent racism, that we need to stand up and speak out. Uh, <clears throat> we need to oppose evil, whatever forms it takes. Uh, unfortunately, throughout human history, the church has misplaced the perspective on evil. It's going after, <clears throat> sorry, after people who are weak and unprepared to defend themselves. No, these are not people who are exercising hatred. It's the exercise of hatred that makes evil what it is. We live in a world in which evil has been revived. Jesus warned us, Satan has been given leave to sift you like wheat. We have to be prepared for this. We see this sifting taking place throughout the scriptures, in Moses, in Rahab, in Elijah, in Daniel, all of whom have to confront the forces of evil in one manner or another. And we have to confront this too. When we say that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, <clears throat> we mean the conquering power of the Spirit that transforms people's lives. But in whatever way is necessary, we need to stand up to this. Uh, just a few weeks ago, we celebrated the life of John Lewis when he passed away. And John Lewis had confronted evil back in the 1960s in extreme forms of racism, had been beaten almost to the point of death, uh, but took the position, a nonviolent position, but stood in the path of evil. There may be situations where we work, where we live, with our families, where we have to stand in the path of evil, to be nonviolent, but to block the power of that which is ultimately satanic. We need to recognize it. We need to understand that we can't compromise with it. We can't somehow accept it to a certain point. The rejection of evil has to be complete and total. Our hope in the battle against evil is Jesus' promise here to Peter. Jesus says, I have prayed for you. Jesus prays for us in the conflict with evil. And so that's especially the reason why we should not be fearful. We should not withdraw. Jesus prays for us. And in his prayers, we have the power of Almighty God. Let us pray. Eternal and faithful God and Savior, we acknowledge that 
Evil does exist in our world. We acknowledge that it depends upon hate. Lord, give us the ability to perceive evil, to stand against it, to oppose it, to give nothing in its favor. And so, Lord, may we demonstrate not only power, but the power of your love, the love that went to the cross and defeated the ultimate power of evil. And knowing that that power has been ultimately defeated, even though it's present with us, we have the strength and ability to stand up and to count on the victory we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for this in his name. Amen. And now, my friends, we are invited to come into God's presence together with all of our needs, with all of our concerns and fears and anxieties to sit at God's feet and to offer to God our concerns and our needs. Jesus told Simon Peter that he prayed for him. Even as, as um, Peter was going to betray him. And, and so Jesus continues to intercede for us. The Spirit continues to intercede for us. And so we come now to join our hearts and minds and to lift our hands to God and our hearts. Lord, you are an awesome God. And with the psalmist, we say, by awesome deeds, you answer us with deliverance because you are the God of our salvation. You are the hope of all the ends of the earth. You silence the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the people. And Lord, we are surrounded by much tumult now all over the world. We have the tumult of the pandemic. We have the tumult in our nation. We have the tumult of the uh, election cycle, the news cycle. And we have the tumult of our ordinary lives, of our individual lives. And so we come needing a place to be strengthened and to um, have some silence and some stillness. And so here we are, Lord. Silence the tumult within us so that we can simply hear your still small voice when we cry out. Lord, we come today with uh, concerns and fears, things that we want to name to you uh, and to, to offer them to you. And there's nothing we can't ask you for because you are so faithful. You want it all. And so, Lord, we begin by just offering you, like the little drummer boy, our heart. What else do we have to give to you? The work of our hands. We also um, bring to you the people that we love. And so, Lord, in this moment where you have stilled the waves, where you silence a space for us to be with you, we want to offer to you our own needs and the needs of the people whom we love. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. And Lord, our church family has needs that they have asked us to pray for them. And so we lift up Nancy and George, Yvonne and Dave, Janet, Akio, Indra, Ellen, Nancy, Barb, Marion and Kimberly, Doris and Daryl, Evelyn and Paul. Eli and Franz. 
Lord, make a space for them in the tumult of their suffering and their illness and their needs. Lord, we pray for our nation. Lord, use us, your people, to be an example of people who can maintain a compassionate, respectful unity, regardless of the differences that we all have, especially during this election cycle, Lord. Help us to be the breath of fresh air, the calming presence, the living water for others who are so upset and uh, reacting. Use us, Lord, but help us and strengthen us and make us that living water. Calm us first so that we can go out in this world and be a balm. Lord, help us to do all the internal work the, that you can excavate into our hearts and help us to know our own hearts and minds and cleanse us, Lord. And then allow us to be a blessing because we're the people you've chosen. You chose Simon Peter. You, choose, you chose those disciples and you've chosen us. We are what you have chosen to work with. And so, Lord, we ask for a blessing over our school system. Help us to be a blessing as schools try to figure out how to meet the needs of their students, particularly students with special needs. Help us to continue feeding the hungry. Help us continue to visit the sick. Help us, especially within our own congregation, to be caring for those in our midst. And Lord, you, you do answer prayer. You meet our needs. And we want to stop and be so grateful for Melissa and Andrew's wedding, for Joe and Aaron's new house, for Daryl's recovery, and that Anne could also go home. And Lord, we know there's some things that we can see in this stillness and in this moment that we want to offer to you as, as, a, as a moment of gratitude. Help us see you at work in our lives and in this world. Lord, we are your disciples and you are our friend. And so we continue to walk with you wherever you want to guide our feet as your people and as a congregation and as the people in the world you've called to follow you. So we follow you. We ask that you would continue to conform us more and more into your likeness. And Lord, part of that work is for us to pray together the prayer that you taught your own disciples to pray. And so we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>